Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Caroline Colas and I am the Senior Director of Health and Wellness at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. And I am your moderator today. And also I am the new curator for this series. Phoebe Atkinson's, who we are so grateful to, has um, passed the torch to me. <laughs> So it just means that I'm very, very busy. Today on the Positive Psychology Hour, we are going to be soaring into strength, inspiring lessons on how love transcends pain. With Lisa Hong Buxbaum, she's the author, the CEO of Soaring Words. We're kicking off the 2023 uh, Positive Psychology Hour in concert with the JCC Books That Changed My Life Festival. If you happen to be in New York, please stop by the JCC. You'll see that our lobby has books and beanbag chairs and a place for everyone to sit and read and discuss the book that changed or influenced their life the most. Lisa Hong Buxbaum is an author. She's a social entrepreneur and a positive psychology thought leader. She's going to share today sort of a behind the scenes tour of her debut memoir, Soaring into Strength, Love Transcends Pain. Her own experience helping others through trauma, grief, illness, and setbacks combined with her own personal experiences led her to found Soaring Words, which is a global nonprofit that inspires children, families, adults, seniors, and healthcare professionals to take active roles in self-healing in order to experience greater physical, emotional, and mental well-being. Wherever you are in your journey, this memoir, her memoir that she wrote, can provide illumination and inspiration to become the very best version of yourself. I welcome to the call, Lisa. I'm going to turn the um, spotlight on you and let me just make you, let me make you a co-host in case you want to share anything. And let me turn the spotlight on you. Hang on one second. There we go. Hello, everyone. Hi, please. Thanks so much for joining us, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. You've always been such a great role model and positive psychology exemplar, um, NIA teacher, founder, visionary, and just all around beautiful person. So I was thrilled when you invited me to uh, join you on your show. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. <laughs> Talk about strength spotting and elevating. We're starting right, right at the top, everybody. That's great. Thank you so much for saying all that. I feel very humbled to be in your presence. You've done so much. Can you first just tell us a little bit about the book that influenced you the most? And then I want to talk about you. Sure. Well, as you can see from my background, uh, books are just so precious and cherished. It's a way to discover parts of myself and it's a way to escape and explore and always be learning and growing. And one of my signature strengths is love of learning and curiosity. So actually every room in our house is covered with bookshelves and I've read them. A book that really influenced my life is The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Um, I read it first when I was a teen, a young adult, and I've read it several times. And just like many things that have so much substance and meaning, each time I came back to it, the book was the same, but I was different. So I was interacting with it and it was speaking to me in a different way. And that book, there's a reason why it sold hundreds of millions of copies. It's because it's the journey about self-discovery. It's about the hero's journey, which is one of the seven uh, metaphor, you know, stories that are in every story, every Hollywood movie, every soap opera, every book usually follows these paradigm formats. And this is about a young man setting out, he's lost, all of these challenges happen to him. And that through that uh, cauldron of wonderful things and really difficult, horrible setbacks, he becomes the best version of himself. And in that way, it's not about the title and how much money is in someone's bank account. It's about all of us having the opportunity on, in this precious life of ours to become the best version of ourselves. 
and books are just such a wonderful way to open our eyes and open our hearts so that we can learn to soar and explore sometimes without even leaving the couch. <laughs> Caroline, I think you're muted, honey. <laughs> I agree. Thank you for uh, reminding me about that book. Please put in the chat, everybody. If you have read that book, I'm going to put a link in there in case you want to um, look it up. Or I've read it. It was so long ago. I, I think when I read it, I was like, "What's an alchemist?" You know. And I love that uh, that you you brought that to my attention. It's kind of like for me, books are like friends right? And so when somebody brings to mind something that I haven't read, or then I'm excited about it, like I want to meet this, this, this book. And then when somebody tells me like yourself of a book that I was like, Oh, yeah, I remember that, that experience and where I was and what I was doing. So thank you for saying that. Now, you've, um, you've been a lover of books, but now you've actually written one, right? <laughs> Yes. So can you tell us about like what led to that? Did you ever imagine that you would write a book and um, and, and how that came about? Sure. So creative writing and self-expression has always been something I've enjoyed to do and a strength. I remember actually the songs I wrote in second grade and the projects I did in third grade that used creative expressive arts and writing. Um, so I've gotten a little better since then, uh, but it's just about the love of expression. And Dr. Jamie Pennebaker is the leading expert in the world on expressive writing. And there's actually therapeutic benefits when we write stories, read stories, listen to stories and tell our stories, especially stories about trauma or difficult things. So I always knew once I started the not-for-profit that I was going to write my own story not as like a ego project, but because I've always been driven to reading books by visionaries, people who create things. And I'm a passionary, a person of great passion and action to help others. So I felt that in telling my story, which the, started as a young girl running to help people and growing up and watching my parents also running to help people. I mean, when I was a little kid, uh, we rescued a blind duck from the duck pond. So it's kind of genetic that I would go on to be part of a healing profession. But I always wanted to learn about people who made a difference, who had lives of purpose. So when I started Soaring Words, I felt that telling my story would be just another healing way to inspire other people when they're going through the most difficult challenges or setbacks from illness or loss or trauma that they're stronger than they could ever imagine. And that's really the point of the book. It's that things happen and we can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we can respond and we can come back to that deep place within ourselves or surround, be surrounded by strangers or kind, compassionate people to bring ourselves back to balance and then hopefully to pay it forward for someone else. Just a little bit about, because a lot of people might not know what Soaring Words is and kind of give us some context of how this happened and what you've discovered with positive psychology, this idea of helping others and spreading kindness and, and how that has influenced your work. Sure. So the story for Soaring Words started after three experiences with death and illness happened in my family in a 10-month period. I call that the trifecta of trauma. So my baby brother and only sibling died suddenly of an asthma-induced heart attack. And I got the phone call at four o'clock in the morning. And a couple of hours later, I was at my parents' home to tell them the terrible news. Five weeks later, my father had a bone marrow transplant and uh, he had a second bout of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the odds were very bad. All of the oncologists told me and my mother he was not going to live. But actually, he survived for 19 years cancer-free. Talk about taking away hope, though. So my mother and I made signs and messages and contests every day on that oncology floor to bring joy and laughter and silliness to all these people, the patients, their families, the doctors and nurses, the orderlies and attendants who are caring for them. You know, being in an oncology floor is 
pretty much not where anyone would want to be. But we transformed a lot of the energy there and just gave people an excuse to breathe and laugh and not feel isolated just for a few minutes. And what I learned from that is your attitude is an integral part of healing. So fast forward 10 months after my brother died, my oldest son, Jonathan, who's a healthy 32-year-old daddy of one and one on the way in March, another daughter, um, he became catastrophically ill with rheumatic fever. He was twitching and drooling, heavily medicated. His idol, his uncle Gary had died. His poppy, his most beloved grandfather was in the hospital. The kid thought he was a goner and it was really scary, horrible time. As the mother, I knew that I needed to be strong for my child and I needed to keep it together. And I was able to do that, you know, really using every ounce of energy and calmness and mama, fierce mama bear energy. But then what did I do to feed myself? And also I had a little one. My youngest son was like three and a half. So it was a topsy-turvy time. And the doctor, the neurologist said, go out of Manhattan. All of his friends are in school. He's sitting in your apartment every day. Just get out of town. So we rented a little cottage 12 miles away and we moved there full time for four months. So from five to six in the morning, as the sun was coming up, I would walk along the beach crying, praying, singing, because that was the only time I had to myself. You know, everyone talks about 24 seven with your cell phone and you're busy and your messages. But when your child or someone close to you is ill, as many people on the call know, when you're caregiving for somebody, it is a 24 seven endeavor. So I was walking along the beach, spilling out my guts, singing, crying, praying, and the name and feeling soaring words came to me from above. I stopped right there in my tracks. I had had a calling. I heard my whole, I saw my whole life pour out in front of me like beautiful taffeta ribbon. You know, you've heard stories of people who have died and come back to life where their whole life flashes in front of them. Well, that happened to me, but I wasn't dying. I just had this knowingness, this calm that I knew what I was supposed to do. And then as my son got better and he went back to school four months later, I just knew that this was what I was going to be pursuing. I didn't exactly know how. And I was on a meditation retreat with my synagogue and you got to sign up for a 20 minute session with the visiting rabbi. And the rest of the time we were singing and chanting and walking in silence, walking in nature. So I got my, my time and it just poured out of me. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do with my life, but I'm running this marketing company. And I, 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 I and my words were coming out. You know, my thoughts were faster than my words. I said, but I, I'm supposed to be doing this thing, soaring words, and I'm going to help hospitalize children around the world and their families and go into companies and schools and and he just said, so you shall. And the minute he said that, that was like the bookend to the calling. And then this was the solution and the gentle push. So you shall. And I started laughing and crying at the same time, which ugly crying and ugly laughing. But I knew, so I shall. And then I came back, started working on the business plan. And that was 20 years ago. And our mission is to inspire people to take active roles in their self-healing so that they could experience greater physical, emotional, and mental well-being. So what does that mean, active roles in your self-healing? And back in 2000, people were talking less about um, wholeness and well-being and preventative. That was still considered woo-woo. But now we all know, and all, because we've all lived through this global pandemic, that we can take an active and integral role in our well-being. We can choose to not want to get out of bed. And, and that's sometimes that's the right thing to do. That's the loving self-care thing to do or take a warm bath. But other times we can change the way our thoughts are. You know, we are predisposed to have these negative thoughts to protect us from wild beasts and danger. But we can say, okay, I hear that negative thought. Like, who are you to think you could do that? but I'm going to just do the next right thing anyway. So the idea was to just help people, giving them these tools to not have their life suck as much as it is 
horrible and terrible and hard to breathe when they or someone they love is going through a challenge or setback or trauma. So I used a lot of my personal experiences and then I used my career as a marketer and brander to put together a, a movement, as it were, a soaring words movement that would help people at the bottom of the bottom, and then also reaching out to companies and schools and hospitals around the world and inviting them to invite people to do something kind to help a hospitalized child or family or someone who's going through um, a setback or challenge. And since then, we've helped over 500,000 people with expressive arts projects and things like that. So it's been a great journey. Wow, 500,000, that's amazing. That is kindness working exponentially. <laughs> so just tell us really practically, do you mean, because I remember getting Soaring Words quilts and Soaring Words, um, what you actually do, so what that would look like. Sure. So um, for the first 19 years, we would uh, partner with companies or partner with schools or partner with hospitals. And then we'd go to a local community. So let's say it was uh, Johnson and Johnson wanted to do something in, in their headquarters in New Jersey. And then that was for like 300 employees that were coming together for a three-day power meeting. So after the, the 20th PowerPoint presentation, I was brought in to do a keynote talk and I brought in 200 or 300 children from the local community, you know, inner city kids. And we would decorate quilts and pillows, little lap blankets with inspirational messages and artwork. And those would be donated to the kiddies in the local hospitals. So that was our signature event. And we also created about 50 different activities, soaring superheroes, soaring artists, soaring poems, soaring constellations that the adults could do, that families could do, that the children could do as part of social emotional learning in schools. And then once the child or the recipient would get the gift, they were invited to pay it forward and make something for someone else. It could be their nurse, their parents, um, the most beautiful things, it's all beautiful because it's seeing people's souls. But going into the neonatal intensive care unit, where instead of bringing these babies home, some of these babies were living in the hospital for three months or three years. And going to those parents and those nurses and doctors and saying, hey, would you like to do something special today for all the kitties here? So for parents to be able to pick up a magic marker or crayon and make a beautiful message for their baby or the nurses and the healthcare professionals to do that. It just changed the paradigm from, you know, not being able to breathe so well to joy and laughter and, and so on. So that was our model for 19 years. And then I met the director of the Jersey City Health and Human Services Agency at an all day conference. And by the end of the conference, she had hired me to train her staff. Because when you're in the caring, healing profession, especially at the front lines, we all know about frontline workers, it can be very exhausting. And there's things that people need to do to fortify themselves, to protect themselves, and to rejuvenate themselves every day. So I was brought in to do these workshops with Jersey City. And in that moment, because I'm a quick start, I said, you know what? It's not enough just to help all these kitties and their families, which was so much in my heart. I want to help everyone. So a lot of us positive psychology practitioners feel that way, where we want to just share the love and share the knowledge, share the latest scientific discoveries that are so easy to do that just take a few moments to create a shift. So from 2019 forward, we started working with seniors and veterans and working at a municipal level with a whole city, with a social service agency. And then when COVID hit in 2020, we were well poised because we already were working virtually. So when Johnson & Johnson grew from doing an event in one city to three countries, to seven countries, we were able to use the technology to have me do the keynote or the opening workshop and then have them turn off the machines and just be in person in those different locations. So I've been living on Zoom like the rest of you for the past three years. And uh, just a couple of months ago, 
Soaring Words and I were invited to submit a grant to the National Institute of Health, which is very exciting because it's a 10 year grant with a lot of dollar signs behind it. And it would really enable us to take these winning positive psychology approaches to help individuals in marginalized communities and to help work with the structures in these communities to shift the balance so that everyone can enjoy healthcare as a, as a right. Everyone can learn to take an active role as the steward of their themselves, their family, their micro communities, and to radiate that outward. So it's a really uh, exciting time to uh, learn about positive psychology. And Caroline has these wonderful workshops every week where she brings in these leading experts from around the world. And it's just right there for you to just uh, dip your foot into the water before you take the plunge. But once you do something just for three minutes or even 60 seconds, you're going to experience that shift. You're going to experience wow, it doesn't have to be so hard, or you're going to feel that joy, you're going to feel that sense of calm and balance and ease. Um, Caroline's famous for saying, uh, as the founder of NIA New York, you've been famous for saying that you want to dance through life. And actually, my Hebrew name is Eliza, which means joy. And I'm really good at being super serious. And I'm really good at powering through a to do list like no one's business. But it's the times when I'm able to just sit in joy or move in joy or just um, relax into a wonderful book and be in joy with that book and those words and those sentences and those ideas, that that's what really fills us up and that's what really uh, nourishes us. Yes, I mean, I love joy, as you know, and Kelly McGonigal is going to come back and talk to us about joy and the joy of movement on February 7th and her favorite books, having um, written a bunch of them. But I'm just interested, I wanna kind of go back. Um, Lisa and I know each other for a long time, but uh, there's parts of her story that it's fun to just kind of unpack a little bit for all of you guys as you're listening to this. I'm hearing so many strengths, right? From perseverance to kindness, to self-regulation. I mean, to, to really have to humility, to just you know being able to persist in <clears throat> this kind of environment. How did you get into positive psychology? Where did positive psychology uh, factor in in, the, in your journey? And how did it influence you, the science of, of flourishing in, in your work? Excellent question. It happened, as many great things do, right here on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So I was uh, running Soaring Words for 11 years. We were making great progress. We were building up a following. We were doing programs in hospitals every week and schools every week. We were doing a lot of corporate events and coming back year after year. So we had really created a nice foundation, 11 years. And I was going in Barnes and Noble because I, I have to buy books. And I tried the Kindle thing for a while. But for me, I need to hold the book. I need to touch it. And also after being on the computer for so many hours a day, I just need to be in a book. So I was going in Barnes and Noble to see what were new inspiring books, self-help books, you know, just to feed my, my love of books. And I'm going up the escalator and I'm looking down and all of a sudden I see this book and it's flashing light. Now I can assure you, I'm very grounded businesswoman and sane person. I'd never seen a book uh, emitting light before. So I said to the book under my breath, I see you and I'm coming. So I went up the escalator and I came down the escalator and I picked up the book and it was Flourish by Dr. Martin Seligman. Now, Marty is considered the founder of the field of positive psychology. And my undergraduate alma mater is the University of Pennsylvania where he was quite famous for all of his work on learned helplessness. So I picked up the book and I said, okay, I'm gonna buy you and read you. So that was a very unusual time. That week, they were predicting a hurricane in New York City. This is before the global disaster, climate change, you know, things that are happening all the time. So when this was happening, people went bonkers. You know, the news, the media, 
People were saying, you know, New York City is going to be evacuated. No one will ever live there anymore. And at this time in my life, um, you know, I was really scared because my father was ill and like, what would happen if all the power went out? My parents lived on the 22nd floor. How would he get down the steps? You know, because this was after 9-11 happened and we know what happened when people can evacuate buildings in time. So we take off, my, my husband and my kids and I were supposed to go to Montreal for two days. So we, we leave town like immediately and we drive to Montreal and I'm sitting there in Montreal away from the storm. I'm devouring this book. Like I stay up till two in the morning to finish it in one shot. And the next day I say to my family, I'm going to go back to my undergraduate alma mater and I'm going to get this master degree in positive psychology, applied positive psychology, because everything I'm doing with soaring words is part of positive psychology. I just had never heard of it. And I want to learn the science. I want to start doing empirical studies, research studies on all the things that we've done to show people that this isn't just a fluffy art project, that what we're doing is serious stuff, that what we're doing works, it's changing lives. Well, my family, I should have called Caroline, she'd be like, you go girlfriend. My family's like, what are you talking about? You work 50 hours a week, you have an MBA. Why do you need another degree? What do you mean? I said, I'm called to the field. So I applied to the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology, which was Marty's program that he created, the first one in the world. Now there's many of them, including the Whole Being Institute, who are wonderful hosts and where Caroline got her training. So shout out to them, amazing organization. And they have many certificates and programs. But now, 30, 35 years into the field, people are learning about positive psychology. People are benefiting from positive psychology. And there's literally hundreds of thousands of people that are devoting, uh, incorporating positive psychology into their work. So I was so lucky that I applied to the program and I got accepted. And I wanted to go there because I didn't need something extra to do. I wasn't twiddling my thumbs and eating bonbons on the purple couch. But I knew that if I could meet the leading experts in the world in optimism, in gratitude, in hopefulness, in mindfulness, in self-compassion, that I could share that knowledge with a global audience, people who would never get a master's degree, people who maybe weren't formally educated, but people who needed and wanted to flourish, people who needed and wanted to be the best version of themselves or to help their families or their communities do that. And that's exactly what happened. I went back in 2012 to 2013, and I've partnered with over 25 of the leading experts in the world. And they've said, Lisa, here's my life's work on post-traumatic growth, on laughter, on uh, resilience and grit. So I've been able to bring their voices into my workshops to share with people who don't own a book even. You know, there's a really painful statistic that most people who live on the planet today don't own more than three books in their household. So for those of us who love reading and are privileged enough to be able to buy books or take books out of our local libraries, um, that's kind of a shocking uh, statistic. But um, I was able to take this these uh, voices and the wisdom from all these positive psychology practitioners and bring them to people in two minute or five minute video pieces or one hour or three hour workshops. So that's what I've been doing um, the last 22 years. Well, you have not stopped <laughs> anybody else but I'm not exhausted, but from hearing about you, I'm just sort of energized by this whole uh, conversation and dialogue. And, and I just want you to know in the chat, uh, Gary said, Yahoo and congratulations. Yeah. And uh, some people were asking about the book being available. Of course, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Thrifty Books, anywhere that you can find that, uh, please do consider um, getting Lisa's book because I you know Tal Ben Chahar talks about this too reading about biographies he loves to read about biographies reading about people and their stories it's very inspiring it helps we see ourselves we identify with oh that part of ourselves and it it, it makes us stretch it makes us yearn for for other things which is great because we have a negativity bias in the brain 
So we know that we're going to be, and we have Scott Simon coming on to talk about the anatomy of fear in January as well, uh, and about, you know, Scare Your Soul, his book. But we know that we have to, we need a little push, right, to, um, to get going. And yet it can be as simple as Dan Tomasulo talks about is washing one dish to get us into action. Speaking of that, you have very simple practices. And that has been the kind of the cornerstone of your work is that it doesn't take, you don't have to move a mountain. You can do one simple thing. And I think of Sonia Lubomirsky's work and you know how people have to do, pick, pick one of these micro interventions, right? And you can make such a difference. I'm wondering what you have found working with so many volunteers, working with so many people that are going through illness and challenge is the key that you think to happiness that you've noticed from your kind of both scientific research that you've studied and also empirical evidence of just being around so many people? Great question, thanks. So a couple of things. I think most people suffer because they think that happiness is a trait. Like you have red hair, you're short, you're tall. It's a trait, you're either happy or you're not. And happiness is a state. So it comes, it goes. And Barbara Fredrickson, one of the founders of the field of positive psychology, talks about micro moments of positivity. So of course, if we're looking at people who are going through setbacks or challenges, or perhaps you're just having a really bad day or week or month, you think, oh, it's like this. It's always going to be like this. But we can shift our mindset, which is the work of Carol Dweck, to have more of a growth mindset to say exactly what Caroline just said. What's one simple thing that I could do, maybe it's put down the computer, go for a walk around the block, a walk around the block, not do a five mile hike, prepare for the New York City Marathon, just go for a walk around the block or just stretch. So there's these simple things that we can do. And I like to think of it as a threefold practice. Sometimes you go in, you get quiet, you breathe. You just maybe even take a power nap for five minutes on the couch or just sitting in your chair. Other times we could reach out. This pay it forward uh, action has been baked into everything that I've done with Soaring Words from the beginning before I even learned about positive psychology. People thought I was nuts. Why are you asking people in the hospital, people whose family members haven't left the hospital for days or months or years, why are you asking them to do something for someone else? Why don't you send them a gift, give them money, just bring them things, bring them chocolates? Like, why are you asking them to do something or make something for someone else? It seemed counterintuitive. But the number one emotion that I experienced in people, thousands and thousands of people, was isolation and being bereft of hope. So by reaching out, reaching beyond ourselves, whether that's holding open an elevator for someone, buying someone a cup of coffee, giving someone a kind gesture or a smile, as we were walking through the streets of New York during COVID, just seeing this much of each other, you can smile with your eyes or say hello. I used to say hello to everyone on the street as I was walking to the JCC six days a week. And it was very disarming and kind of funny, but I wasn't doing it to be mean. They're like, do I know you? I was like, nope, I'm just friendly. Have a good day. But each one of us, you could just say hello to someone, you could hold a door for someone or help an older person get in and out of a taxi cab. And I always, even at my lowest of the low days, when things weren't happening or I was stuck or frustrated, I said, I never want to be so busy or so self-important that I wouldn't spend that two extra minutes to help somebody open a door, you know, that needs help or help someone, you know, carry their groceries. So these Simple things that we can do, reaching inward, reaching outward. And then for me, the last thing is reaching upward. So there's spirituality with a capital S and there's religion with a capital R. And then there's the lowercase versions. For me, I practice my Judaism. I always had a deep belief with God. Although sometimes I have God amnesia. It's like, I forget. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to be God instead of just being Lisa. Um, but it doesn't have to be something you know, religious. It could be walking in nature or just 
looking at the sky. It could just be hearing a beautiful piece of classical music. It could be dancing or just moving your body in a certain way could be a transcendent experience. Dr. Richard Tedeschi talks about the five stages of post-traumatic growth, heightened appreciation for relationships, a sense of awe and wonder, transcendence, a, a sense that we are stronger than we thought we could ever imagine, and then a sense of purpose. So while no one wishes for a trauma or setback or things to happen. And who here doesn't want this pandemic to just go away for once and for all? But guess what? It might, and it might not. So what do we wanna do in the meantime? So we can reach in, we can reach out, we can look up, we can breathe. <laughs> so those are some of the just micro interventions. And then all of these things, I'm not just making this stuff up. Um, they're all backed by science. You can go to Google Scholar and type in what you're looking for. I need more resilience today, or I need more agency or self-efficacy, or I need more humor today. And you could see the benefits, scientifically proven benefits, measurable benefits for all of these micro interventions that just take a few minutes to do. And that once you do them, you can share them with other people. And we've all heard about contagious, like germs are contagious, wash your hands, parel yourself, mask yourself, all which is good. But positive emotions are also contagious. And once you start laughing, or once you start smiling, or once you start not ingesting all the fear, that can help other people model your behavior, model your thought process, and to do the same. The last thing I just want to say is don't watch the news and don't watch the news late at night because that has been proven to be really bad for your health. So that's something that um, is also very helpful. Amazing. Amazing how you have just like embodied positive psychology is are sort of a walking encyclopedia for micro interventions and ways and reasons why they work. It's just, it's just astounding. Thank you, Lisa, for, for just summarizing that for us so well. And I, I had a dear friend that passed away. And one of the things that she taught me and she used to do, and it's in, in keeping with what you were saying is that she would go to the, the shelter, the women's shelter, the battered women's shelter, and she would work with the kids and she bring presents, not for the kids, but for the kids' mothers. And the kids would make cards and they would wrap up the gifts and they would give those gifts to their moms uh, because often they had, they had nothing. They had to run in a way in the middle of the night. And she said something that always stuck with me, which is that everyone should know the pleasure of giving to another, right? right? Which is what you're saying. And I wonder, let's unpack a little bit about emotions because this isn't happyology and yet you work with it's very important when we're you're confronting an illness to be authentic and to be real when you're sitting with an, another human that perhaps is you know in their final stages of being on the planet and you can't say something to like them like it's all going to be okay because it's not in those moments, where does positive psychology play for you? So that's a really beautiful and insightful question. So having had the pleasure of being a, a death doula for my best friend from college, I spent the last three days of his life with him. Um, the story's in the book. It's called Standing Tall. His name is Paul Stephen Miller, and he was born a dwarf, and he went on to become the commissioner of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And when he graduated from Harvard, um, he was Harvard Law Review, Harvard Law School, and none of the firms would hire him because they said, and I quote, we could never hire you. We're not running a freak show in the circus. If our clients saw you, they would be disgusted. So he couldn't get a job. And then ultimately he got a job with a legal not-for-profit and he went on to write the Americans with Disability Act. So when he had cancer, he sent an email which said, uh, I've been given six months to live. And I've sat on this email for five months because I didn't want to have pity and 
sorrow. I wanted to live my life with my two young children and my wife and just live my life. So I got this email. I was hysterical crying. My son and husband came over. What's wrong? What's wrong? I just handed them the laptop. I couldn't even speak. And sometimes out of the mouth of babes, my young son, Josh, said to me, don't worry, mommy, you're going to see Uncle Paul before he dies. So the next morning I called and he said, his wife said, and he said, you could come in three weeks because her parents are coming and da, da, da. So I went in three weeks and I was privileged to be there. I think that what I've learned over the past 22 years is that you have to meet people where they are, where they're re It's not about us. It's all about them. So you ask them anything you're feeling, you want to talk about, what don't you want to talk about, let them lead. But if they do want to talk about it, then it's a beautiful opening for you to listen and let them talk about it. Um, I've had so many conversations bedside with people, couples, individuals, old people, young people. What was so meaningful to you? What are you most proud of and why? What are you grateful for? And just to be able to be privileged to be part of those conversations. Because at the end of the day, you know, we can't take our ATM cards with us or our cars or our resumes. It's what did what I do matter and do I matter? And, and that's what it's all about. So I think for all of us, there's an opportunity to show up, be authentic and be present, let the person lead, but don't be afraid to talk about what's really going on. You know, when I was growing up, when someone would die, you know, grandma or grandpa went on vacation. We'll talk about scaring the crap out of kids when mom and dad wanted to take them to the Jersey Shore. It's like, I don't want to go on vacation. I might never come back. I mean, I'm using gallows humor to make the point, but that is 100 years ago, 50 years ago, that is how people treated illness and death and cancer was the C word. You didn't say it because maybe if you said it, it would be contagious and you would catch it. So we've evolved, but not really so much. Who wants to talk about sick children or people dying? No one. But for those of us in the healing professions and for all of us who know people, maybe who did die during COVID or who are suffering, it's such an honor to be able to just hold someone. And you don't have to go there. Like you don't have to become a shrink and a therapist and a psychoanalyst or an oncologist. You could just say... I'm sorry you're going through this, but I'm here for you. And then, um, you know, be specific. Is there anything, you know, I could do for you? And, and, and be very specific because people always say things that are well-intentioned, but a lot of times they have the absolute opposite effect. Like after my brother died, you know, some people would say to my mom or dad, oh, well, at least you have another kid. Like as if that was a consolation prize or you know, so people are just doing it because it's so uncomfortable and crossing the street to avoid the person. You know, these are all like survival skills. So I don't assume that people who are doing them are horrible individuals. I just, I know that it's really painful and it's really hard to um, show up. And sometimes you could just send a handwritten card or an email or a text or leave a voicemail. When my son was ill, I'd get like 30 phone call messages a week. I couldn't return any of them. It was such an all-consuming thing, but it was nice to know that people were thinking about us and sending us love, sending us strength. So I hope that answered your question. I hope that's helpful for people. And there's a lot of information on our website, soaringwords.org. There's a lot of videos and um, there's a lot of information. What percentage of the time do you find that you are in your work kind of teaching people these skills that you're talking about, right? You talked about sort of the three steps, but I wonder, it sounds to me like there's an educational component about teaching people that it's okay to be human and how to be human. Yeah, I think my purpose for being here on this planet is to be um an illuminating presence, a guide, a teacher, but not in a didactic way. I also am very open to being open. So I learn from everyone that I interact with. So I want to share my personal experiences, which is what the book is about. There's all these zany, poignant, funny, 
crying, sad, like it, it's all over the place. It's messy, <laughs> but that's what life is about. So I want to use everything that's happened to me or my family and use the educational opportunities I've had to bring that down to really help millions and millions of people to know that this is all there for them. This is our right, you know, as, as Hal Banchohar says, permission to be human and, you know, make every day great. It's your choice to do that. And that which is not to discount that a lot of people are really struggling, but some of the most happy and joyful people I've ever seen have been going through the most adverse situations. Um, and when my brother died, I said, you know what, I feel really blessed because what I had with Gary in 35 years, some people never had with their siblings or their relatives. So we have a choice. Is there any day that goes by where I don't wish he was physically with us? Of course. Is every holiday kind of diminished? Usually that happens like the week before the actual holiday. And that never goes away. But um I think that we all have an opportunity to keep learning, keep growing, and keep sharing that kindness and testing things out, you know, testing things out. This is a very exciting time to be alive. Um, it used to be that they said you couldn't teach an old dog new tricks or, you know, once you got to a certain stage, that was it. And the work of Carol Dweck on growth mindset and the work of neuroplasticity, that our brains are constantly growing and expanding and creating new neurocircuitry. It's very exciting. We have the potential to really shape shift, as it were, to become the best versions of ourselves. And the best way to do that is to find communities like the Whole Being Institute or the JCC, the Marlene Myers and JCC, where there's all these programs every week, all the time, where you can go and be with strangers or friends, meet new people and learn new things, always growing and learning. That's what children do. They're always look, growing and learning and exploring and it's fun and it's exciting. So we wanna be able to see things through child's eyes, but bring our whole life experience to it. So I, always know that a few things. Um, and it's very intimidating to be in this community because a lot of the people in the positive psychology community are academics, they're PhDs. They spent 70 hours a week for eight or 10 years to become a PhD. So when I started in the master program, I'm like, oh, so then I'll get my PhD because they'll count this 50 hours a week that I'm doing for soaring words. And they're like, uh, actually, no, you'd have to do this 70 hours a week. So I was like, no, thank you, because I want to be in the world applying the knowledge to people. So I know one thing. I'm never going to be the smartest person in the room. I'm never going to be the most credentialed person in the room. But I know that if I show up with a full heart, and if I show up and people can see that I'm here to connect with you so that you can connect to your soul, which is beautiful and pure and strong, and that still strong voice within you that all of us have, then I feel that I've done what I wanted to do today in being here with all of you and Caroline and, and this week with working on this big grant and then just, you know, sitting on the purple couch and relaxing and enjoying and being grateful to do nothing because I'm not a human doing, I'm a human being. And at age 62, I'm just kind of learning that that's kind of a new concept the last few years. Like, wow, it's really fun to watch series on Netflix and Amazon. I never did that before COVID. It's really fun. Now I get it. You know, and it's it's not always going and doing and, and just being. So that was a very long answer to your question. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I wanted to go into the chat because we have some questions and we have some people that are kind of looking for some inspiration. Um, Deb has a friend that has um, Parkinson's and um, has been struggling and doesn't seem is wanted to support them and, and it doesn't seem to be working. Maybe she should just let him focus on his negative thoughts and to process his, his own diagnosis. And the tricky part about Parkinson's of course is that apathy and depression are um, 
one of the side effects of that. So you're really somebody with Parkinson's, I've heard, you, you want to know your enemy. I've heard a neurologist say this. I think it's interesting to think of an illness as an enemy. I, I would might change that. But he said, know, know what you're up against, basically, and, and look at reality directly in the eyes and know that that's part of it. And there are days when Parkinson's wins and there are days when Parkinson's doesn't. And he finds that very much like what you're saying, Lisa, that the Carol Dweck model, that those that have hope bear more, so much better than those that don't. But any thoughts for, for Deb on that? Yeah, so it's really easy to, um, to know what's right for someone else, right? So easy, like, I know exactly what's right for everyone on this call, and I'm gonna tell you what you should do. However, if you've ever had a neck spasm or your lower back go out or something happens, you know, pain is an amazing teacher, but it's also, it's really disarming. It can really derail you. And there's a lot of studies showing that chronic pain and unremittent pain can just um, get in the way and botch up a lot of natural parts of our body. So no one chooses to have Parkinson's and there's a lot of anger, um, just like when we've talked to a lot of people who are going through dementia or Alzheimer's or other catastrophic things, like no one wants that to happen. So it's important for us in answering this specific situation as not being the one that's carrying that pain to separate the person from the illness. And there's a whole thing about people first language. Like you don't say a dialysis patient, you could say a person who's on dialysis, you put the patient first. So in this case, we have to parse out the illness from the person and it sucks. I mean, it's, it's, it's really sucks. So um, sometimes it might be helpful to just say, you know, I'm angry too. Um, but I think um, what happens for people is what they're hearing, even though you're not meaning that, is that you think that they are not doing enough, that you think perhaps that they're weak, you think they're not trying, you think that it's their fault, that they're angry. So when those kind of comments happen, it's really hurtful because the person feels like you're judging them. And no one wants to be judged. You know, no one wants to be judged. So that's the piece where if you could sort of meet the person um, in friendship or just meet the person to say, hey, I'm here with you. You know, I'm going to come over tomorrow. But what do you want to do? Do you want to go out? Do you want to stay in? Like, let them lead. Let them have some agency and choice. But then, um, you know, let them also have their feelings. And I had a really long conversation with Hal Ben Shahar who's one of the founders of the field of positive psychology. His books are amazing because he said to me, you know, Lisa, as positive psychology practitioners, everyone thinks we walk around all the time, floating on a cloud, happy, not a care in the world. And when I tell people, when I, Dr. Talba Chahar, tell people, you know, that I also have negative feelings, they don't believe me. So I was raised to be a good girl, to be happy, to be positive. And when COVID started happening, I was on a lot of Zoom meetings and I was getting ticked off. It's like, you're complaining, but you, you know, to myself, you're complaining, but you have a roof over your head. You're complaining, but you're not attached to a, um, you know, a, a breath machine so that you don't die. Get over yourself. I was judging everyone. I was so judgy. It was disgusting. <laughs> but then I realized like I had a mother. I have a mother. She's amazing. Caroline knows her. Joanne knows her. She's amazing. She's 85 and she's badass. But I was worried about her because all her friends weren't seeing their kids or their grandkids, but our family was, and they were scaring her. So I realized I have all these negative emotions too. I have all this fear and anxiety, but I'm such a positive psychology person that I wasn't letting myself feel them. I was stuffing them further. And when we stuff our negative emotions, it they just come out sideways. It comes out through our ears and passive aggressive comments or anger. So a really good gift that you could give this friend with Parkinson's, Deb, is to let them express it without having to fix it or talk about something else like the weather. So 
it's good to experience all of our emotions because getting back to what I said earlier with Dr. Jamie Pennebaker, when we write about our emotions or trauma or negative experiences, and when we hear other people talking about it, and when we talk about it, we can get it out of our bodies onto the page or sharing it with a healthcare professional or a close friend or someone who's not gonna judge us, someone who's gonna just say, I'm sitting here, I see you, I'm giving witness to you. Richard Tedeschi, the founder of the field of positive psychology, um, sorry, Richard Tedeschi, the founder of the study of post-traumatic growth, he and Lawrence Calhoun, his partner in this field, talk about expert companions. You don't have to be an expert, you just have to be a good listener or a healing wise presence. And when my son was catastrophically ill, my expert companion was Krishna. Krishna was my children's babysitter. And I knew that when she was with my little one or with my son, you know, if I had to run out for an hour or take a meeting, that they were in good hands. She had my back and she could just listen. So I could give a lot of my fear or my crying to her instead of giving it to my parents who were really worried about the fate of their grandson and had just lost their son. So expert companions, each one of us has the opportunity to show up to a stranger or someone we know and love and be kind and just listen. Amazing. Lisa, you are an extraordinary human. And this has been an incredible hour. I'm so grateful. I've been reminded, I've been inspired, I've been educated, I have been moved. Thank you for Thank you. your time and for your brilliance. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that next week on the Positive Psychology Hour, we're going to have Unita and Joanne Edgar here talking about growing up in the segregated South, a conversation about birth books, hope, and life journeys. And this is a conversation in honor of Martin Luther King uh, week. I encourage you to not miss this. Just like today, um, this was such an incredible, um, evocative conversation. And um, Gary, I'm going to send you an email. I want to have you come and talk about your inspiring books and, and uh, your, your uh, thoughts. I don't know if you have anything that you want to add uh, as we close, but um, I just feel so blessed to have spent this time with all of you and to have had Lisa on as our first guest of 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks, everyone. I'm sending you strength and love, and I hope you'll buy my book and read it. It's in paperback, hardcover, ebook, audiobook, and uh, I hope you'll post a review on Amazon and uh, Caroline, you're amazing. I always learn and grow from you. You are just sunshine. Thank you. Right back at you. Feel free to Excuse unmute me, This everybody. is Barbara. Hello, can I say something before we leave? This is Barbara on the phone. Sure, Can I just say something for a moment, please? This meeting, Caroline, I've waited for you to come back. I've been in your classes for the last two years. You are just so special and powerful in my life. And you always bring these amazing people who are above and beyond anyone I know. Lisa was wonderful, so meaningful. What is the name of your book, please? I lost that in the beginning. It's soaring into strength. Love transcends pain. Soaring into strength. Love, love transcends, transcends pain. pain. And you said it's an audio, which I need right now. Yes. And the okay. actress who does it, I was listening to it. It's the 10 hours. She does a better Lisa than I do. <laughs> so, Lisa, what is your last name when I go to order it? Lisa Honig, H-O-N-I-G. Booksbaum, B-U-K-S-B-A-U-M. No one can spell it or pronounce it, but if you okay. type that in, you'll find it. Yeah. Caroline just... and Lisa, I thank you. I, I don't even think thank you is the word. I, from the deepest part of my heart and soul, you, you will never know how much you give to me, especially today. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Right back at you. We all give to one another. And I thank Lisa for being here. And I thank you all. We will continue our journey on the Positive Psychology Hour next week. Please don't miss it. Take care, everyone. Be well. Bye.
Bye-bye. Be well, everyone. Thanks so much.